Hello and welcome to today's Queensland Centre for Domestic and Family Violence Research webinar. Today's topic is when the internet becomes a weapon in DFV, looking into the relationship between sexting, revenge porn and stalking presented by Dr. Marika Gugisberg. Without any further ado, I'll hand you over to Marika to begin. Good morning everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I hope you will find this talk informative and helpful. I will provide information on the interrelated topics I feel passionate about and I am grateful for the opportunity to talk to you today. Before we begin, allow me to acknowledge that the topics discussed today are sensitive. There are strongly held views and controversies about it and the importance to discuss in relation to sexting, prevention, and stalking, so that we are all better informed about this phenomena. I appreciate the potentially damaging effect of abuse for those who have been harmed. I took this photo some years ago in Switzerland for mutual tranquility and calmness being able to be confronted by unpleasantness such as cold icy wind. When I took the photograph, it was winter. The temperature was below freezing. If you look closely, you can see the ice underneath the pretty red bench. This is what I would like to achieve today, that we can discuss issues that need to be addressed calmly but courageously to work towards the goal to make the internet a safer for everyone. I am aware that the content of today's presentation may elicit discomfort or even distress. In such an event, please feel free to leave the webinar and if you would like to talk to someone, contact the National Domestic Violence Helpline 1-800-RESPECT. This is 1-800-737-732 or Lifeline on 1140. These are free support services that are available 24-7. It is my hope that you will not forget the narrative of the women that I have integrated in this presentation today. It is these women and their children that keep my passion going to work on the often difficult and confronting topics such as the internet being used as a weapon in domestic and family violence. Okay, let us start. The internet is a part of our daily life. It has become an integral part of us and I often wonder how I live and work without the internet revolution that took hold of humanity. If you have time later on today, may I invite you to reflect on what you use the internet for during a normal working day. When I contemplated this question, I devised a very long list, which included connecting with people privately and professionally, doing, do, doing research for work, but also looking at recipes. Of course, I believe the internet is a good invention, and I guess you do too. But it also has a number of risks that need to be considered. Yes, the internet is a valuable resource for all of us, including women involved in abusive and violent relationships, practitioners working with these women, government representatives, policy makers, counselors, psychologists, and interested community members. This includes our Queensland Centre for Domestic and Family Violence Research, others such as the Domestic Violence Resource Centre in Victoria, the Western Australian Women's Council for Domestic and Family Violence and all the teachers engaged in violence prevention education. The internet connects us all and provides an important platform for information and education. However, the internet also provides perpetrators of abuse and violence with a platform to exert control over women, to threaten them and to instill a perception of omnipresence. Against this background, technology has provided a medium that enables new forms of intimate partner violence, 
commonly referred to as revenge porn and cyberstalking through information communication technology devices. But I am getting ahead of myself. Let us see how things unfold. The Internet is a global medium, and there are different moral and political perspectives on issues such as what some people call pornography. There are many different forms of pornographic content found on websites. David Wall, in his book Cybercrime, The Transformation of Crime in the Information Age, stated that the majority of Internet pornography, whether it is soft core sexual imagery or even hardcore imagery depicting penetration and other sexual acts, even extreme pornographic material depicting acts on the borders of consensuality, are unlikely to be prosecuted so long the acts are consensual. Here we see the slippery slope of the issues we are dealing with. Terms are used that are highly subjective and there are no universally agreed upon definitions. For example, I get challenged a lot during conferences and asked about my definition of pornography and whether I believe pornography is good or bad. In relation to the quote, note the suggestion that hardcore pornography is when penetration is depicted or other sexual acts, but these are not further specified. Then the author indicated that there is little chance of prosecution for acts that are, quote, on the borders of consensuality, end quote. What does that mean, I wonder? The reason for problems in the area of sexuality and crime is that moral and legal issues overlap. This results in considerations and discussions that are emotionally charged in nature and questions arise on what exactly should be regulated and how legislative powers should be used. Suddenly the discussion becomes an issue of moral debate. One such issue is the behavior that emerged in recent years, which is called sexting. At the moment, there is no universally accepted definition of sexting. I prefer the one offered by Kosenko and colleagues. It is the use of digital devices such as computers and mobile phones to create and exchange messages and images of a sexual nature. This definition is sufficiently broad in that it includes using words and pictures. It also indicates that these messages and images are sent and received. I would like to note that contrary to popular perception, sexting is not only practiced among adolescents, but it is also a common practice among adults. In fact, some research suggests that sexting is a healthy and normal behavior used by over 80% of adults inside and outside of committed adult relationships. However, there are problems with prevalence data given that research into sexting in adult relationships is in its infancy. Some scholars indicated that sexting may even be underreported due to embarrassment. A second misconception is that sexting necessarily results in negative consequences. Recently, Research in Germany by Descartes and Tula found that sending and receiving erotic texts and images by couples in intimate relationships did not lead to negative outcomes. In fact, this is consistent with my experiences during class discussion. I have taught postgraduate students in sexology courses in recent years and with an average age of students being in the 30s. During class, we had interesting discussions about how students engage into consensual sexting to spice up their intimate relationships. This challenges the notion that only young people, such as teenagers, engage in sexting and that it is necessarily undesired behavior. Sexting 
coercion is a term coined by Druin and colleagues. After their study found that there was a relationship between women's experience of coercion and physical and sexual forms of intimate partner violence. Their research indicated that one in five women engaged in sexing behaviors even though they did not want to do so, either because they felt obligated to give in to demands by their partner or because of actual threats of physical or sexual violence. The researchers argued that sexing coercion was a form of intimate partner violence with the use of communication technology being an additional weapon, and they suggested that the very presence of sexing coercion may be indicative of a woman being subjected to violence by her current or former intimate partner. Petron and Frank defined revenge porn as the distribution of sexually graphic images of individuals without their consent. This term indicates that the reason for distributing such images or videos is for revenge. Indeed, often these behaviors are related to jilted lovers who are current or ex-partners. They distribute sexually explicit images out of revenge. This is often motivated by a desire to embarrass, humiliate, or black male the victim. Of course, they are also uploaded to specific revenge porn websites, called, for example, ex-girlfriend porn, or mainstream porn sites along with social media sites. There are a range of behaviors and motivations for distributing sexually explicit images without the consent of the person depicted, not only for revenge. This may include recorded sexual assault and images that are obtained from spyware or hidden cameras or stolen from the cloud and images that have been photoshopped to show a specific person's face with another person's body. This insight led to criticism of the term revenge porn. was originally generated by the media. So a number of different labels have been offered instead that are used by academics, including non-consensual pornography, involuntary porn, non-consensual sex. But stating that these images are porn has also received critique in the literature, as this suggestion may be really offensive for victims. To direct focus away from the victim, and direct attention to the perpetrators and the perpetrators' behavior, which constitutes abuse and sexual violation of a person, the term image-based sexual abuse has become adopted in the most recent national and international literature. You may want to reflect on the conceptualization of what has been referred to as revenge porn and what you think of the term image-based sexual abuse. It has been suggested in the literature that the term image-based sexual abuse directs focus of attention on the behavior of the perpetrator rather than the victim, and that it is sufficiently broad to include the diverse range of harm experienced mainly by female victims. Also, it was argued that using this terminology helps understand that images and videos are not always created consensually and that perpetrators have been found to use the threat of distribution as a way to enforce coercive control. And in relation to child exploitation materials that are produced and distributed over the internet using the term image-based sexual abuse helps differentiate between adult victim and child victimization. However, the term is not liked by everyone for a number of reasons, and I am curious what you think about it. I will use this term for the remainder of the presentation. 
It is important to note that the threat of distributing consensually or even non-consensually obtained images can have severe and long-lasting damaging impact. Women who have been victimized by the actual distribution of such images have reported severe negative effects. For example, they have reported anxiety, depression, sleep disturbances, and severe social and financial impact due to losing their employment and relationships with family members and friends that have broken down. Of course, the knowledge that they have been violated and that their images are out in the cyberspace often manifest in mental health and physical health issues that require health care, which impacts the victim not only financially, but also socially. Just imagine the impact for a woman referred to as Jane Doe by Tennant. She made reference to a woman whose ex-boyfriend, I quote, created a fake profile of her on an online dating website. He impersonated her, posted sexually suggestive images of her, and shared her personal cell phone number and home address. He continued his assault on her privacy and reputation by creating additional fake profile pages on porn websites, including several revenge porn sites, where he posted sexually explicit images and videos of her. He linked her profiles on these pages to her LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram accounts. End quote. You can imagine the many negative effects Jane Doe suffered as a result of her ex-boyfriend's action. Image-based sexual abuse has been used in intimate partner violence context. Werner and Lab, in their book Victimology, defined intimate partner violence as a pattern of abusive behavior in any relationship that is used by one partner to gain or maintain power and control over another intimate partner. This includes any behaviors that intimidate, manipulate, isolate, frighten, terrorize, or threaten, blame, hurt, injure, or wound someone. You see some example behaviors on the slide here. Importantly, these categories are not mutually exclusive. Usually, women are exposed to several of these behaviors at the same time. Allow me to emphasize here that while intimate partner violence is clearly a gender issue, this does not mean that it is always the case. I have knowledge of cases where the victim offender role is reversed, with women being the perpetrators and men being the victims. However, with image-based sexual abuse, it is generally the victimized women who are coerced or forced into producing photographs and participating in videos that are taken by the abusive partner. Professionals working with women and those in family court are acutely aware of this issue. These professionals notice that being coerced or forced into producing intimate images or videos may impact the women's ability to leave an abusive relationship and seek help with the police and other support services. Victim blaming attitudes seem to exacerbate the many negative impacts for victims of image-based sexual abuse. As with any form of sexual victimization, victims tend to be blamed for all sorts of behaviors and with sexually explicit images they may have to put up with claims that it is their fault, given that they have taken the pictures themselves or agreed to have them taken by another person. You can see how sexting and image-based sexual abuse are related. Do you think people should be blamed for their sexting behaviors? For example, being careless, not knowing or considering that and videos can be used in a way that was not intended. In addition, victims have been found to be at risk of stalking because their personal contact details are often revealed. 
Let me share this quote with you by Laurie Bergman. As wonderful as it is for individuals to share their daily lives online with friends and family, the internet users who are victims of domestic violence may be vulnerable to further abuse or may experience harassment or stalking through the social networking medium. Stalking as one form of intimate partner violence has started to be recognized in the literature in recent years. Stalking by an intimate partner includes behaviors such as making harassing phone calls, sending letters, text messages on a mobile phone and email, and or physically following the victim and, of course, by the stalking. Research found that stalking significantly increases physical forms of intimate partner violence, including sexual assault, and a positive relationship has been found in the literature between stalking and femicide, which is the murder of a female intimate partner. It is not surprising that women subjected to stalking experience more severe mental health problems as a result of fear when compared to those who were not subjected to stalking. The key features of stalking behaviors are that they elicit fear, extreme emotional distress, and a sense of being unsafe. Of course, the internet is a welcome tool for stalkers. Turner and Glass indicated, quote, as far as intimate partner violence goes, stalking often takes place once the victim has decided to end the cycle of violence, once the woman is determined to abandon the abusive relationship. The male may resort to stalking activity or threat in an effort to her escape and re-establish control over the victim. And there are a number of myths about stalking and stalkers. Here are the top three. First, ex-partner stalkers are less dangerous than stalker, stranger stalkers. As a matter of fact, it is quite the opposite. The most dangerous stalker is by far the one who is stalking his current or ex-partner. A second myth is that stalking is a form of flattery. Let me tell you that there is nothing romantic about stalking. It is a serious crime and should always be taken seriously. And the third stalking myth is that an ignored stalker will give up and go away. If it only were as easy as ignoring a stalker. The stalker has an agenda, exerting power and control, putting the victim in fear, and creating the perception of omnipresence. A number of typologies have been developed in recent years to better understand stalking and its effects on victims. As with the definition of stalking, there is no universally accepted typology in the literature. However, what researchers agree upon is that partner stalking is not only the most frequent form but the most dangerous as well. Let me briefly introduce you to this subtype of stalking. Partner stalking has been found to be motivated by anger, which is linked to the history of the past intimate relationship. The stalker is usually hostile, wanting to re-establish control after a relationship breakup. Stalking behaviors are characterized by high levels of verbal threat, physical violence, including sexual violence, and property damage. Partner stalking in the context of intimate partner violence has been identified as a chronic problem. Type 2, love obsessional. In contrast, love obsessional stalking situations are those in which stalker and stalking object, the victim, have no prior relationship. These stalkers are the type that victimize celebrities known as prototypical obsessed fans. While this type of stalking receives wide public attention, obsessional love stalking is actually less likely to result in violence against 
resulting victim. And type 3, erotomanic stalking takes place when the stalker delusionally believes that the stalking victim is also in love with them. This class of stalkers is the rarest within the classification system, but it is familiar to many clinicians because it overlaps with diagnosis of delusional disorder. A unique characteristic of this group is that the majority of stalkers are females, often young women, whose victims are classically men of higher socioeconomic status. These typologies offer some insight, making it clear that partner stalking is the most common and most dangerous form of stalking. It is important to understand that each case is very unique. Let me provide you with an example from my research and give women a voice. Listen to the report of Kelly for it. He said, I remember when we were separated for six months, he used to follow me everywhere. He knew everything, where I went shopping, the car and registration number. It was just so frightening to see him follow me everywhere. He would just appear everywhere. And Laura, of course, this is also a pseudonym, said, he came to my workplace secretly watching me. He used to pop up and say hello. He then said, you were talking to a man with a blue shirt. He used to watch me and say, why did you laugh with your colleague? I became totally depressed and I suffer from anxiety. This makes my life difficult. Let me talk about cyberstalking which is the repeated use of electronic communication devices to frighten the victim. Ex-partners are most likely to be physical and cyberstalkers. Cyberstalking appears to be just one more weapon to exert power and control. Ex-partners remain the most important group of stalkers. Cyberstalkers use mobile phones, computers, along with information and search activities, cameras, and GPS devices. For example, they call and leave messages and videos, they send text, access information on mobile phones, iPads, and computers, and turn victims' phones into a listening device. This is not only an intrusion, but creates a sense of omnipresence. My research found that women complained of their partners or ex-partners' omnipresence. They said that the stalker always knows where they are. Illegally installed spyware can keep a log of the victim's computer activities, including security information such as passwords. Spyware can also seek out information stored on the computer's hard drive. This information is then relayed back to the person who initially installed spyware. Unsurprisingly, the use of spyware has increased considerably, and there are even instructions how men can use this technology to spy on their female partners or ex-partners. With today's technology, stalkers do not need to have access to, to the device to install spyware. This can be done remotely, and it is not only free, but you find instructions on YouTube. For example, a man explained how to install a free device called Flexify, you can see that on the slide here, without accessing the target device and how he deceived his girlfriend in doing so. To me, this is very concerning. There are many consequences of stalking. Women experience fin financial consequences through loss of income, medical costs, social consequences of having changed their routine, 
choosing to stay indoors, leaving the job, which also impacts on relationships. Then, psychological and physical consequences, such as increased fear, distrusting others, nausea, gastrointestinal conditions from chronic stress, experiences such as anxiety and depression, panic attacks, and sleep disturbances. This is how Sally, which is of course not her real name, described her experiences to me. He sometimes harasses me at work and checks up on me all the time. He's obsessed with jealousy. He rings me in my office sometimes ten times one day. That can drive me crazy. I am still working, but not for long anymore. I wouldn't be able to cope with this. I think it's just harassment out of jealousy. It is not only the stalking that frightens me. I got to the stage where when people ring to ask me out, I am not going. Of course, people stopped ringing me. I lost a lot of friends. He is using the kids to check up on me. I think part of this is probably his revenge because I made a step to actually start and leaving him. He has caused me so much heartache. He has caused me so many tears. He has just caused me so much pain. As Sally's example shows, victims of stalking often feel unsafe in their own home, and this contributes to significant distress. In this webinar, I discuss that the internet is a great tool that we all use privately and personally and professionally. Recent research suggests that sexting is a practice also used by adults, not only teens. If it is consensual and pictures or videos are shared freely, sexting has been found to be a healthy and gratifying couple experience. However, text messages and images can be used by a disgruntled lover after the relationship ended. Image-based sexual abuse is always a risk, even if no prior abuse or violence was experienced. Of course, if the images are obtained by coercion or force, the threat to release them forms a part of the cycle of intimate partner violence. Physical and cyberstalking have been found to be one form of intimate partner violence. As I discussed, the internet provides perpetrators of domestic and family violence with a platform to exert control over women, to threaten them, and to instill a perception of omnipresence. Against this background, technology provides a medium that enables new forms of intimate partner violence through information community, communication technology devices. In terms of future directions, some suggestions have been made. They include advice such as women should stay offline, adopt a male persona online, or not engage in sexing behaviors. Of course, this is not helpful and reinforces victim blaming attitudes. It is clear not all men are violent, but I sincerely believe that all men and boys have a positive part to play to help stop violence against women. And we as professionals, parents, and community members are addressed equally. Men have been recognized as important part of social change, including sexual practices and behaviors towards women and girls. Prevention strategies can have many forms, including public education, using the technology, such as this webinar, Knowledge and understanding of how technology is used can challenge attitudes that are supportive of violence against women and ensure that victim blaming is minimized. Using that technology messages, such as making women safety a man's issue, can call out for perpetrators to take responsibility. Furthermore, the internet is a great tool to create the cultural change that is needed to provide assistance for victims and prevent abuse and violence from occurring in the first place. 
It is a tool that unites those who work relentlessly to create the cultural and social changes that are needed. See, for example, men who join the global movement, hashtag stand up for white ribbon. These men pledge their support through raising awareness and education, as well as through role modeling and stepping in when needed. Working together in the online space, practitioners, policy makers, law enforcement professionals, women's and men's organizations, teachers, and interested community members will eventually lead positive change for all members of society. This is my hope. Thank you for participating in today's webinar. I trust that you receive helpful information to think about technology and issues of sexting, image-based sexual abuse and stalking, all of which are relevant not only but also within the context of intimate partner violence. I am happy to respond to any questions or comments. Here are my contact details. Thank you. We would like to thank Marika for her presentation and thank you to everyone for attending the webinar. We hope to see you at another Queensland Centre for Domestic and Family Violence Research webinar soon.